Hi, this is Wendy Arnowski again. This is going to be the advanced video for finishing. This is a sequel to video one, which was basic techniques about finishing. We'll try to expound upon them a little more in this video, get into some of the finer points of doing a really nice finish. This is tradition. This is the 1987 concourse winner. This was the second one I won the concourse with. And in this video we're going to talk about candy apple paint, doing some different types of trim, letra sets, ink lines, just some of the finer points in general of finishing. And one of the first things we're going to talk about on this video is wood. It seems like all balsa wood is not created equal, that's for sure. In this case I've marked a piece that I think is really soft. You can bend it with your bare fingers, you can just squeeze it and break it off. Some of the wood I have in the shop is so hard you could shave with it. This is real light and soft wood. Now obviously if you build an airplane out of light soft wood, it's going to be light. It'll probably be real weak too. One of the other things it's going to do though, that's a problem for finishing. It's going to absorb a lot of paint. It's like a sponge. In fact, I just got dust all over the table. Light wood has a very bad habit of sponging up paint. That's problem number one. Now, for anybody that's looked at balsa wood real close, you'll see there's little grains in it. If you notice, no two pieces of wood will have the same type of grain. Some will have long stringy grains. Some will have almost no grain at all. So when you select wood that's going to be on the outside of the plane, wing skins and things, obviously you should try to find wood that doesn't have deep grains in it. Deep grain. is going to mean extra paint. Now the difference between the difference between a basic good finish which probably uh, you'll be getting on your first magnum and a super finish is going to be that the basic finish is going to be 10 ounces and a super finish is going to be 7 ounces. And we're going to look at some of the different ways of getting rid of that 3 ounces. Some of the things we can get rid of one of them is the extra paint. With all the extra paint that's involved, filling the grain and soaking into the light wood, we want to be doubly and triply careful that we don't wind up up in a 10-12 ounce range for the finish. Now if we're given the fact that we're going to use mostly light wood to get the plane light, Obviously one of the things we want to look for is the lightest wood we can find, light wood, smooth grain, sanded flat. If you're not sure what sanded flat means, just refer to the basic video. This wood now is what we're going to be dealing with. If we were dealing with real heavy wood, 12-15 pound wood, it would absorb a lot less paint. It would definitely have a different grain. Some would be better, some would be worse. But we'd still have to sand it flat. So obviously step one is going to be, same as the basic video, is getting the raw wood sanded flat. And that's always the thing that separates a truly great finish from a mediocre to good finish. And now, it's even more of a factor, it's going to separate the light finish from the heavy finish. It's how smooth is the raw wood so that we don't have to pile on coat after coat of filler. If we're going to start with a, a grain that looks like that and we're going to fill all these valleys in again, just like I said before, and then we're going to keep sanding and sanding, we're going to wind up with a mess. It's just never going to be perfect. A good finish is always going to start with good wood. And I just can't emphasize that enough. Now, we went back to the basic video to find out about sandpaper. 80 grit, 
120 grit, uh, 180, 220. These grits of sandpaper are used to change the shape of wood. When you have a flat piece of wood and you want to make it, let's just say this is the piece of wood, and you want to make it round, you change the shape of the wood with the sandpaper. You can see what we're basically doing. This is 80 grit paper. We're changing the shape. It comes off real easy. But now that we have the shape that we want, we're going to want smoother paper. We're going to probably want 320 or 400. We're going to want a smoother grain to put that nice final finish on. We'll want maybe 320, 400. No matter what we use, we're going to want to wind up with 400 as the last sanding on raw wood. You sand all the raw wood with 400. Knock off the dust. And what you have now, if you can see it on the camera, is smooth wood. It doesn't have a lot of grain. It's smooth. It's relatively nice. Now this is ready for the first coat of dope. After two coats of dope, this is going to gradually change shape a little bit, and we'll go back and sand it again. But we've changed the shape. We've put a radius on that corner, changed the shape with rough, finished it off with 400. That's always the technique that's going to work. We don't want to start sanding the wood with 400. All we're going to do is breathe in hundreds of pounds of sawdust. Change the shape of wood with rough paper. Go back, get ready for a finish with 400 paper. So again, we have 400, 320. 320 is really taking it a little rougher than we really would like. 400 would be my first choice. Final sand wood. All the shapes are in. All the radiuses, contours, we have the shapes that we want. We're not going to change the shape of the wood. We're just looking to put a surface. So th these would be the two sandpapers for, for achieving a surface. Once we have that surface, it's nice and smooth, nice and flat. We've got a minimum of grain in it. And obviously, we're going to want to put some dope on. Now, for the sake of argument, we'll talk about right now, just butyrate dope, all SIG. We won't get into any of the trick ways of doing this. There's obviously a lot of trick ways using epoxies and polyurethanes and things that generally, in my mind, always come out a little heavier and a little grittier and they're almost as much work. So why not pay the price right up front and know that you're going to have the lightweight and the nice finish. Just pay it in time and don't sleep as much at night. That wood surface now, now that we've achieved that nice flat wood surface, we definitely, definitely, without question, want to keep it flat. The way we're going to keep it flat is by using a minimum of thinner. Now, even if you brush on the dope, it should be 50 thinner, 50% 50 dope, 50-50 mix. If you try to use 25 thinner, 75 dope, what problem you might run into is you're going to get no adhesion. When you don't have enough thinner, you get poor adhesion. Later on in the finish, tape is going to pull up. Now because this is an advanced video, we're dealing with a couple of advanced concepts here. We, we assume you're going to put a fancy paint job on. Not having the tape pull up the paint is, a, is a definitely a consideration right from the get-go. So right from the get-go, make sure even if you brush it on 50% thinner, 50% dope. And what you achieve that way too is you might have to put more coats on, but what you'll achieve is you won't have as many brush marks either. So a good basic starting point for this finish is going to be three coats. And this you could go back to the basic video where we're really just being a little redundant here. But we're going to do it in a little bit different way now. We're going to have those three coats on, 50-50 thinner. We don't want to cheat the thinner and get poor adhesion. We don't want to risk the tape pulling up. We want to get the three coats of dope on, and then we're going to just a light sanding. 
get off the fuzz because what's going to happen you're going to get little hairs coming out of the wood if you looked at it under a microscope it would be a little fuzzy it would be a little bit like this we want to block, knock it back down to this with the three coats of dope now because this is the advanced video we can talk about a couple of tricks that I've tried and one is I've tried to take the raw wood surfaces and let's just make that this is the grain these are things that I've found haven't worked well. I've taken DAP, added a little bit of water to it and troweled on DAP, troweled on a layer of DAP so you almost couldn't see the wood and then sanded it down so that in the grain of the wood I had this. I just had DAP in the grain. Now I'm sure there's other products, Mod Magic Model Filler and that, that re they're really DAP. You're buying DAP at 10, 10 times the price. But anyway, I have found this, the problem with this technique is this works well until you take the airplane out in the sun, that the sun seems to bring the grain right back. So that's something that I'm suggesting you might want to try, but if it doesn't work, don't be too frustrated. I have not found that to be a good idea, and since this is advanced techniques, at this point in time I want to get rid of that one right away. The other one I haven't found to be useful for me is filling in the grain with, and we'll just do the grain again, uh, the old troweling on the, the glue method, troweling on a coat of Hobby Poxy 2, filling in the grain with the glue, wiping it off with an IBM card and paper towels, and in my mind this is just a shortcut to nowhere. I have never seen a plane finished in this method that's won the concourse and there might be one and maybe Ted's is the one I don't know but it seems like the only sure way to keep the grain from coming back is this word right here tissue if you somehow avoid the tissue inevitably the grain seems to come back and so what I'm suggesting right now is we go right into the the full finish method we have the three coats on cover everything with tissue. I like double O silk span. If you use O, and you can use heavy. It's three grades of silk span. This will work out the lightest, the easiest to use. I would not consider making a plane that didn't have every outside surface covered with tissue. Now, attaching the tissue, you can do it wet. That's my first choice. You can take a little atomizer put water in it like a thing Windex comes in. Just get the tissue damp, not wet, damp. And then it's a good idea to take a towel and blot it. Put a coat of fresh dope over the area. Let's say this is the coat of dope. We're going to dope over the area. Lay the tissue out bigger than it has to be. Start in the middle and work your way out. Work out all the wrinkles. Let that dry. When it's dry, trim the edges. If you still have wrinkles, put three coats of dope on, give it a light sanding. If you somehow avoid doing the tissue, or if you sand through a spot, if you sand through and in the middle of it there's a little hole because you have a hydro, make a little patch just a little bit bigger than a hole. It'll disappear in the paint and eventually. But I want to have, when I go out in the sun, I want to have tissue over every surface. No other material that you're building the airplane with, from the wood to the carbon fiber to anything, has anywhere as near the strength of the tissue on a plane. The amount of tissue that's on the plane is probably a tenth of an ounce, and it adds so much strength that it's just immeasurable. So my suggestion is not to try to avoid putting the tissue on, pay the price, put it on, do the sanding, Get as much of that done out of the way as you can and get on with the nice finish. Okay, the most common filler is dope talc. One third dope, one third talc, one third thinner. In my mind, this is the only way to fill grain. Some people use auto primer. It's a second choice for me. It's a choice for spot repairs, but not for the whole plane. It tends to really get heavy if you blow on a lot. 
Also a material called red lead. Spot repairs, little repairs. Nitro stain. And I'll just put this on so people can see what this looks like. This is a body filler material. It's generally red or gray. It's good for filling in little spot repairs, but not certainly not for any big giant areas. It has no strength at all. If it's like DAP, it's just used as a cosmetic filler. It's not a strength builder. So, of all of these fillers, take your pick. I would always be sanding the filler with 400. I'm always sanding the filler dry. I never sand it wet. You may find somebody or a method that you can you can sand auto primer wet and what happens you run a tremendous risk if water gets down into the wood through one pinhole you can just make a washboard out of a foam wing you can ruin an airplane red lead you can sand it dry you can sand it with 400 and get little stain little uh, gaps little dings filled in fine but for my purposes what I'm suggesting is if possible don't use any or very little of this. Try to get all the big work done with dope and talc. This is where it gets to be fun. This is what separates the concourse planes from the 18 point planes is the silver. Sand 400 only. Sand as many coats as you want. Sand it off, put it on. You're actually using the silver for a fine filler. If you have a big ding, a big gouge, use the nitrous stain. But silver, back and forth, back and forth. Sand it off, put it on. Check out the Nobler or the Sidewinder videos and you'll see just how many times you have to put it on to get it perfect. This is important. This is what makes or breaks the airplane, is the silver. When all the silver is sanded off and you put the last coat on and you look at it, it should look like an aluminum airplane. Now, keep in mind, this is what's going to happen when you spray the plane silver for the first time. This is exactly what's going to go through your mind. Oh no. When you spray the airplane silver, the reason you're spraying it silver is to pick out all the mistakes. When you pick out all the mistakes, if the plane is going to be black, you can sand the last coat of silver off. If the plane is going to be white, yellow, red, leave the silver on. The silver has to be perfect before you go on to the next step. Silver, perfect or else this is what you wind up doing. You go crazy. You commit aluminum suicide. Now this is an advanced technique. Here's the wing of the airplane. Let's just make up a pretend trim. Let's say that you want this area to be red rest of the wing to be white. Well, typically people paint the whole plane white, then they mask off the whole plane and paint this red. What I'm saying you should do is paint this red first, paint this red, mask off the shape that you want, mask off this shape of the trim. Then take a piece of newspaper here, a piece of newspaper here, newspaper here, newspaper here, and just airbrush in your trim. Pull it off and when you're finished you're gonna have this. The trim is painted. Now the only thing left to do is take this trim, cover the trim, and paint the airplane white. Now you might think, oh, what's the big advantage? The advantage is usually the trim is roughly one quarter to one third of the airplane. So why would you want to have one-third or one-quarter of the plane double painted? Especially in the case of if the airplane is red and white, there's going to be a problem covering. 
you're going to double, double half to paint the plane. Especially if you try to put white trim over a red airplane, anything over black, it's going to be a nightmare. So, I'm suggesting you do this. One of the ways to do this, and it was in one of my finishing articles, Flying Models, let's make up the typical wing, is to take that real neat tape that we have and mask this out in silver tape. The airplane is silver now, and I've put this outline on in eighth inch tape. Now what I do is I mask to the inside of this. Here's my newspaper going on in four pieces. Okay, and I paint the inside. I pull off the masking tape. And I don't take off the piece of the eighth inch tape. I leave the eighth inch tape on there. And now I tape this off. And I still have that border in tape. So that what I wind up with, and now I can paint this any color I want. Pull off the tape in here, and I have a red trim with a silver stripe around it. And it looks like a lot of extra work, and it really isn't. It's a great way to make the plane look a little more complicated and busy than any other way that I know of. Trim first, save a little bit of weight. Again, when we get into advanced finishing, we're trying to save weight. The heaviest thing on the plane is the colored paint, especially if you're going to try to paint the plane white and make it really white. Biggest saving you're going to have, you definitely want to do the trim first. Once you do it this way, I don't know anybody that ever went back to doing it the other way. It's a lot less total work, and you come up with a nice job almost every time. Now here's a couple of don'ts, a couple of things I've tried, and they haven't worked well. Don't substitute SIG silver. There's automotive silvers, there's other brands of silvers. Sig Silver is the best one for picking out the mistakes. The grains of silver in the, in the paint are exactly the right size that you get the maximum reflective effect that you want to pick out the mistakes. Don't substitute Sig Silver. When you get to this point in time, you want to keep the plane clean. What I typically do is I wash my hands about every half hour, 45 minutes, because you're sweating and you're picking up dirt and dust in the air. Try to keep everything clean. It's nothing more, really more frustrating than finishing a white airplane and seeing a big fingerprint somewhere in it. After you put the clear on, all these little bubbles and ink lines seem to come out. Another thing, when you're sanding silver, let it dry. Extra dry in time is really critical. If you put silver on, you try to sand it the next day, it turns to chewing gum every time. When you try to sand it a week later, it's a lot easier. When you sand it a month later, this is, this is what a piece of sandpaper would look like when you sand in silver correctly. It comes off as dust. It's dust. When it comes off as lumps of chewing gum, it's not correct and you have a problem. Let it dry. If you can afford to, put it by a heating vent. Let it dry for a while, it'll be this, a lot easier to sand. It will not be a big pain in the ass to sand. Now in the basic video, the video before this, we covered the technique for putting on the clear. No point re-going over that, just check out the first video. Some basic tricks for putting on the clear that I found to work almost every time. If you have a dehumidifier, and again this is starting to get into where it's it's a little bit high tech. I would run the dehumidifier from the two days before I start painting if I'm going to do it inside a garage or a house. Run the dehumidifier 24 hours a day, dry out the air, get the temperature up to about 72 degrees if you can. Even in the summer have heat if you don't have a spray booth. Try to get the air dry. The whole purpose of this is to get the air dry. When the air is dry, you can spray with less thinner. And less retarder if you're going to need it. 
Now, if, if you can get away with this, obviously if it's raining outside, wait. Wait for a dry day if you do it outside. If you do it inside, get the humidity down, get the dust level down. If you're doing it in a garage, a cement thing, wet the floor. When I do it out in my driveway, I take a garden hose, wet the driveway, if it's a nice dry day outside. It kills off a lot of the dust that ultimately winds up in a plane. So these are just some basic things that will help you get the clear on nice and neat and flat. All basic stuff. This is all basic stuff. Now what happens when you go to buff out the plane? You have all the clear on, and this is the most frustrating thing in the world. You go to sand out the plane, and it doesn't shine. A lot of people try to use compound only, forget about it. It's going to take forever, it's going to be a mess. You must sand the surface back dull and flat. I like to do that with 1200 sandpaper. Some people, Jimmy Casale, I believe, uses 600 and gets the same effect. It means you're going to buff a little more and sand a little less. You must get the surface dull or flat. When you see that surface, if it has little pock marks in it, you have to keep sanding down until it's dead flat, until all the overspray is off. Then, and only then, will it buff up easy. The other trick to buffing is this word, wait. Wait for the paint to harden. If the paint isn't hard, you're in trouble. If it doesn't harden, you're just going to rebuff it over and over and over and over again. It's not going to hold a shine. When paint is hard, six to eight weeks, sometime even more, depending on how much thinner, it'll stay hard, it'll be hard, it'll hold a shine. You can sand it without the sandpaper turning into chewing gum. This sometimes is the hardest thing to do for any of us, including myself, is to, to spend that six weeks, go paint your house, uh, work on some other airplane, work on a project before you buff it. Now, one of the things it's worth talking about now, we've kind of walked through a typical dope finish again. Let's talk about individual things Let's call them don'ts. Two apostrophes, don'ts. Here's a couple of things that I found in my little exploration of finishing that every time I did them, I had a problem. Mixing paint. This is maybe you win, maybe you lose, mostly you lose. If you start with SIG, try to use SIG all the way through. If you start with Aerogloss, even though I don't recommend it, use Aerogloss all the way through. Even though you can get away with putting Aerogloss first and SIG on top, Aerogloss on the bottom is okay. SIG on the top, that's okay. I don't recommend it. I like SIG all the way. If you, for instance, put SIG first and Aerogloss on top, Sig on the bottom, arrow on top. This is what's going to happen every time. Sig always goes on top, arrow gloss on the bottom. That's no exceptions. If you use epoxy, my suggestion is use epoxy to seal the wood, epoxy filler like K and B, epoxy color, and epoxy clear. That's okay. Don't use epoxy and then SIG and then something else and then something else and you're lost. If you're going to do epoxy, epoxy all the way. If you choose Aerogloss, go with it all the way. SIG all the way. The exceptions are, these are the exceptions with SIG since mostly what we're talking about is SIG. It's okay to use acrylic. Acrylic is auto paint. Now this is where, this is an advanced video, let's try to make an understanding of this. Candy apple paint. 
all my red planes, the candy apple ones, the purple and green one, they're all done with candy apple. You can mix and match SIG and candy apple and acrylic. No problem. This is all okay. No problem. SIG and acrylic is all okay. Here's the problem here. This is where people get in trouble. You start off SIG, you do some acrylic, say the colors, and acrylic clear. This is still okay, this is all compatible, but this is heavy. Relative to SIG, it's three times heavier. Now the only problem is, if you use one-third the amount, you're okay. So if you use a quarter SIG, and you use one-third a quart of acrylic, it's going to be the same. And that's exactly what it winds up to be. If you decide you're going to do clear acrylic, use the formula that's in the basic video, just use one-third the amount. One-third of a gallon. And you'll wind up with the same weight, the same everything. Remember, acrylic is three times heavier. The solids in acrylic are three times heavier. Is a basic advanced thought. The pigment in the paint. In SIG, is very little pigment. The reason is pigment is heavy and it's expensive. So they want to keep the cost of the product competitive. They put in what amounts to be a minimum amount. What you can do as a modeler is add pigment. Now the way to do this is go to an auto body supply store and buy raw pigment. Or you can buy it from Pro Stun Products or anybody else that sells it, but make sure it's acrylic. Acrylic raw pigment. You can add the acrylic raw pigment to the SIG four ounces into 16 ounces. We'll be okay. Now I've tested back and forth and tried to make that 7 and 8 and you can still do it but the paint gets awfully awfully hard to spray. This is my suggestion. 4 ounces of paint into 16 ounces. This would be 8 ounces of thinner, 8 ounces of paint. That would be 20 ounces of total material. 20 liquid ounces should be enough to do a plane. If it isn't, you've screwed up. and you're not spraying correctly. Add raw pigment, you'll save a little weight because instead of using 30 ounces, 32 ounces, which is a normal amount, 16 and 16, again, you're adding pigment, which adds weight, but you're using a lot less material, and it's going to cover in one coat, and it's going to cover without a lot of thinner going down into the substrate. So, this is a good thought. Extra pigment, for me, has worked out good especially if it's white or yellow. In red you almost don't need it, in black you definitely don't need it. In white, if you don't have extra pigment, enjoy putting on all those extra coats of white and waiting for them to dry. Now, one of the best things I've seen in all my, all my days of flying, I've seen at least four or five airplanes that had fuel get into the tank box, for whatever reason, the tank leaked, the tubing came off, or it just leaked in there, and the plane self-destructed. The tank box was not fuel-proof properly. What I'm suggesting you do in a tank box area, the part of the plane that you can't normally get to and wipe off, is fuel-proof it. Epoxy is my best choice. The real first choice here is Imron. Imron is totally fuel proof, but it's, it's too toxic to use for average person. So second choice is epoxy. K&B epoxy would be a good choice. 
And what I say to do is turn the plane so the tank box is facing up and pour in an ounce. Slush it around with a, a stick with a paintbrush taped to the end and then turn the plane upside down and hang it by a nail and let anything extra drip out. A hairdryer warming it up will make it a lot easier for it to soak in too. But fuel proof in the tank box, if you forget to do it, it's going to be a sh very short lifespan on the plane. As soon as there's a little crack somewhere, the, the fuel gets into the glue joints. Nitromethane is CAD bonder. The plane is on its way downhill. Fuel proof in the tank box, an important step. And I would say don't fuel proof it with one coat of SIG light coat. That's definitely not the way to do it. All right, another advanced finishing technique. Anybody that ever wanted to paint a spinner and had the paint come off, it could really ruin your whole day. This is a typical old Vico spinner. The paint's come off. Here's one that even though the plane's been crashed and mashed in five places, the paint hasn't come off. Okay? Here's one that's, this will show you every step. Now this plane's been crashed. This is the one Stifle crashed, by the way. The plane landed on a spinner. What I did here is I anodized the spinner first. Anodizing makes a good bond for paint. Then I've used one thin coat of auto primer, and then I've used the lacquer, and here you can even see the clear peeling right off. You can almost see it coming off. If you don't anodize, second choice is, we probably have one of them spinners here too. Of course you can always chrome plate, that's another way. And the chrome plating usually peels off if it's aluminum. Here's one that the paint is coming off already. Now, if you take 80 grit paper and make this, the spinner really rough, the best choice is to sandblast it, of course. Sandblasting is always choice one here. Anodizing, aluminum anodizing is the way to get paint to stick forever. You can also buy a product at the airport that they use. It's a green, a light green paint that they use to bond aluminum to paint. I don't remember the name of the product right offhand, but it worked real well. I had a can. It was very toxic material. Though. This is a this is a long nose spinner that I made that uh, the paint is sticking to pretty well. Sticking the paint to aluminum. The best way to do it is to anodize the aluminum, scuff it up a little, use auto primer first. If you can't anodize, scuff it up with a. 80 grit paper, put two coats of primer, sand the primer, and you'll usually have it last one season before it starts to chip and peel off. Now this is candy apple paint. It comes in about 25 different colors. It's sold only uh, commercially. It's not supposed to be sold. In fact, there's warnings on the can not to use it if you're not a professional. So we're all professional, so it's not a problem. But this is the kind of paint that would that would produce the real shiny, this is the purple in this case, finish. Uh, you can buy small amounts of this from Pro Stone products, so you don't have to shell out $35 a can or 40 whatever it is. Uh, it seems to be getting harder and harder to get this material, but it is compatible with SIG. It must go over a silver or a gold base, and it will sparkle up and otherwise dull aeroplane, give it a nice little uh, extra color. Another thing that's always a pain in the neck to do is make wheel pants. I hate wheel pants. These are the, the raw fiberglass wheel pants as they come from Brian Ether. They have a pretty well sanded out finish, even though I like to sand them a little more. They're already cut out for the wheel. They have a little reinforcement in here. You can get these from Pro Stunt Products. They come from Australia. But what I would say to do with these, if you made a fiberglass cowling or wheel pants or whatever, any fiberglass material, you want to sand it with maybe 320 or 400. After you're done sanding it, get a nice finish on it. You want to put at least two or three coats of auto primer on, sand it again, let it dry overnight. Then the next step would be, obviously, you want to wind up somewhere down the road with, let's say this airplane is going to be white. This is a coat of acrylic white on here. Let that dry overnight. Sand that maybe with 600. If you don't go through, 
and you don't need a second coat, and put a few coats of clear on it. Acrylic clear would be fine. And these you could wind up with if you want stripes. These are the ones off the cardinal. Some stripes, some fanciness on here. This would be fine. Then three or four more coats of acrylic clear, sanded and buffed out, and you'll have yourself a real nice finish. And these are super lightweight. It's a really nice job he did making up the mold for these. They seem to fit our stunt ships just about right. They're a nice traditional shape. They don't make it look like a lunar rocket or anything. Nice little accessory for all planes. But again, if you're painting fiberglass, you want to auto primer it first. You don't want to go right in with dope on these. Let it have a few coats of auto primer. Now if you refer to the basic flight trim video, this is an important advanced concept to learn. If this is the CG of the airplane, which is usually about where it is, about 15% from the front of the wing, what you see is all of this, the whole amount of the paint on the airplane, almost the whole thing, is behind the CG. So what it means is, the more you paint the plane, the more it's going to be tail heavy. Now, to make a good case of what you can do, you build this plane like I did, the plane the Killer Bee. And oh my god, it's tail heavy. What do we do? Well, we start at the very back of the plane and sand off, start on the bottom of the tail, sand off the clear. Sand off the clear till you see you're going through. Now this is the bottom, the bottom of the elevators, the bottom of the elevators. Plane still doesn't balance. Sand the top of the elevators. Sand the top of the stabilizer. That almost balances, but not quite. Okay, now you can do the rudder and the back of the body. Sand off all the clear till you see you're going through with 1200 paper, then stop and buff it out a little. Sure, you'll have little spots where it'll go through, but it'll be better than having a tail heavy plane. Now, even if worse come to worse, do the flaps too. In fact, on the Killer Bee, I wound up stripping all the paint off and monocoating these. I did Monaco because I wanted that CG to be right. Without that C, now it's especially when you overpaint an airplane, it gets tail heavy. If you have a plane that's tail heavy and the moment arms are correct, it's probably because you painted it. If you used heavy wood, of course, that would contribute to it, but most likely it's because it's been painted too much. So you can always take paint off. You can always strip all the paint off and Monaco it. Well, hell, you don't care how much paint you get from where the bell crank is forward. Put a thousand coats of paint on the nose. Paint to death, the leading edge to death. But from the bell crank back, and especially the tail, be real careful. I always tell people, the bottom of the tail gets, you stand on the other side of the room and look at the spray gun. That's how much clear goes on the bottom of the tail. The top of the outboard wing, paint it to death. Paint the outboard tip, put extra. Hey, that's what they're going to see in appearance judging. This wingtip, try to keep it light. Don't go crazy. And the bottom, don't go crazy repainting the bottom of the plane forever. Because nobody looks at the bottom of the plane. They don't pick them up. They don't look. If they did, it would be a different story. Nobody. I remember Bob Gildini's, one of his airplanes, I looked at the bottom of it. I thought he forgot to paint it. But, yeah, you get away with stuff like that. But what you don't want to have is that tremendous tail heavy. In fact, any plane that has nose weight in it, take the nose weight out and start sanding the paint off the bottom of the tail and get rid of the nose weight. The whole plane gets lighter and it'll fly better. Instead of adding more tip weight, sand the paint off the bottom of this tip. There's a lot of little tricks. Obviously, there's a limit to how much you can do this, but always think in terms of taking weight off instead of adding it up here. You'll always come out ahead of the game. Now, I'll take one minute and just look at this airplane as an example of this airplane was built. It was a little bit on the heavy side. And what I had to do, I took the whole bottom of the tail and sanded the clear off, the whole bottom of the stab, because I didn't want to add weight in the nose. This was an absolute priority. Now, what happened? Let's look at this picture, get a nice picture in your mind of how this plane looked, and we'll go to step two.
Now this picture here shows you what had happened here. It had taken off early in the morning, really before it was too light to fly, and hit a skunk cabbage and took off this whole wing. This whole wing had been off of the plane along with the flap, so it required a tremendous repair. Now, matching candy apple paint, fixing the sheeting, repairing the foam, luckily this airplane didn't have wing gear or it would be gone, was a tremendous job. Doing all this work really didn't make my day complete. But there was a contest coming up in two weeks and I really wanted to bust my buns and get this plane flying. And uh, you know, the local rivalry between Jimmy Casal and myself, I really wanted to have this airplane to fly against them in the flushing contest. So I did this real quicky repair. Now we're going to get into repairing planes a little bit later, but this is just one of many repairs that I've had to do. And doing these repairs is never fun, believe me. It doesn't make your day complete when you have to go and repair a plane that should have been a front row plane at the NASH. Should have been, wait a minute, it was. This was the 86 plane. I did take some pictures of it so I could share this uh, the little technology of fixing it. Again, what I did, I used all auto primer, sanded off all the paint, got it down to bare wood, went right up with dope, tissued it, retissued it, and then when I got to the point of using filler, rather than using dope filler, I used auto primer so I could blend it in better, it made for a better blend, before I went back and painted all the candy apple colors on. And this was a really big job. This plane, by the way, this was in 1986, this plane went on, uh, Several other people flew this plane and used it to good advantage, so it really did it really did pay to fix it. It was, definitely wasn't a write-off aeroplane. Now here's the plane. Every, you notice everything is masked off except the bottom of the wing. The auto primer makes a good barrier between the old paint and the new paint. It's an excellent way to repair, and I would suggest if you have to repair, always rely on auto primer. Auto primer and spot repair thinner. Remember we talked about thinner earlier on. Spot repair thinner is the way to get that so you don't have a lot of bleed down into the paint and melting. If you were to use regular thinner on this, all this paint underneath it would get jelloey and soft and mushy. When you use spot repair, you just go right over it. Ten minutes later you can sand it and get on with it. Problem is it does add a little weight and you do get not the best adhesion in the world. So, of course, you have to be a little cautious about doing it that way. But again, if it's going to save you an airplane, hey, it's worth it. In this case, it saved a plane that went on to live three more years until Stifle crashed it. Okay, how about a little bit? There's, there's very few people among us are not going to have to repair a plane sometime. Let's say this is the, the part that we want to repair. And we have this spot in here that got dinged, nicked, or whatever. Well, what we could do, if this was the side view, we could fill that in with nitrous stain, just trowel it on and sand it off. Then what we would want to do is auto primer a little beyond it, spray a little bit of auto primer beyond it, so that from the top view the auto primer would look like this. Okay, then we'd want to just feather sand it in with maybe with 600 feather it all in until we couldn't see the, till it was smooth. Then spray paint obviously a little beyond it till it get the color to match or, or mask it off at a trim line and repair that whole panel. But now, some of the good things to remember about repairing airplanes is always use spot repair thinner. This is spot repair thinner. Notice it says spot repair. It doesn't penetrate. If you go back to the uh, the first video, I went through this a little bit. This thinner would be great for doing repairs. If you were going to mix up the clear to color, all of the things, the only thing you're going to lose with this thinner is when you go to pull tape off, it might or might not be a problem. 3608S would be a little better choice if you weren't uh, overly concerned with that. When you just have to touch up a small area, especially the clear. When you put a little gouge in a plane and you want to just fix the clear or the color, mix up a little batch with this. This will definitely save your day. It'll make your day complete when you have to do repairs. 
And I don't know anybody that's going to get through life without having to do repairs in this hobby. It just seems inevitable. Now, you know, when you get to the, the expert level, you're going to want to develop your own trim scheme. Like a little trademark for your airplane. Now, these are just my suggestions when you do develop this. These are things not to do in my book. Again, remember, this is all subjective. This is not carved in stone. What I would suggest is if you decide you're going to paint the leading edge on a wing red, well, you could make a matching red bar here. Just to make it easier on yourself. If you decide you want to put a star here, like Ted does, put a star back here. It'll stay aesthetically pleasing and balanced. Even if you're not an artist and even if you're not a, uh, oh, just, just have an eye for this kind of stuff. If you keep it simple, keep it balanced. Now, there's a way to figure anything that's here should be half the size in the back. So if you have a three inch bar, this bar should be an inch and a half. If this star is five inches, this one should be two and a half. So you'll have a balanced trim. This will be like a little mirror image of what's in the front. If that's the, the style you're looking for. Now, other people, I think Cassie's the most obvious one. They have a trim scheme that's, that, that may be different on the wing, say, and then you come to the tail and it's like that. Well, this we're not talking about. If you decide to do this kind of a trim scheme, you know, that's fine. But, and, and it's not any better or worse than this, but when you're looking for the balanced presentation, the classic look, what I'd say to do is just divide everything in half. If you decide this is going to be a quarter inch stripe, make this an eighth inch. Everything goes in half at the back, and it'll just look like a little mirror image. That's a subjective thing. It's a thing that I like to have, is to have all the trim match on the plane. Same thing I always try when I design a plane, make the wingtips. If I have pointed wingtips, I want the tail to have a wingtip. If, if this is square, I want the back to be square. If it's uh, whatever, whatever it is in the front, if it's like that, I want the back to be like that. But again, this is for symmetry. This is just part of what I want. There's, a, there's also like the Thunderbird that has an elliptical wing and a, maybe not totally elliptical tail. Well, that's another approach, but if you're looking for a symmetrical approach, this is a good way to get it. And it's a nice way to arrive at a pleasing package. Now, while we're speaking about subjective things, one of the things I didn't like is, let's just say you decide you're going to make the trim go this way and you're going to put this stripe coming down this way and you're going to put a star over here and you're going to put a stripe here and a diamond over here and you're going to put eight ink lines over here. See, in my book, this may be a valid style and it's like the Chinese European style, but it's not the classic stuntship look and I, I much prefer the classic look and I didn't particularly like this and I Many people I've talked to haven't really cared for that, let's call it the international look like the Chinese seem to have now, where there's just trim going everywhere and in every direction. Now it may, it may look, and then you, you turn the plane over and it's totally different. I prefer the classic look. If you're after this look, then try to get some pictures of the Chinese airplane and copy them, or the Russian airplane. I, I just much prefer the classic look where everything is balanced and it matches. But again, remember, that's all subjective stuff. It's a picture of Frank McMillan's plane. That's a good example of how the balanced front and back, everything is mirror image down onto the tail from the wing. It's a nice balanced package. Carries the same theme across the top block. Carries the stripes onto the rudder. Matches the lettering on the body with the lettering on the wing. Real good approach. Some things to keep in mind. I like to get ideas for paint jobs. One of the places I always look is in hot rod magazines. They always have some real nice paint jobs on hot rod cars. I guess if you know anybody that's a car collector, go get their old magazines. Nice symmetrical approach. Everything that's on the wing is mirror imaged back on the tail. 
Real nice approach. The lettering's nice. That's a nice paint job. And here's the classic good looks. Classic trim that matches front to back. Unique lettering. Nice little thing. Snake painted there. Lettering matches. Trim on a body matches the trim on a wing. The classic design. Absolutely classic and beautiful. In my eyes, that's one of the prettiest ships ever made. Just another couple of classic beauties to give you some idea of classic trim schemes. Two of my favorites right there, the Aeron and the Ballerina. Absolutely two of the nicest. Classic good looks. Not radical, not off the wall. Classic good looks. And one of the things we want to at least talk a few minutes about here is doing ink lines. Ink lines can be something that either makes or breaks the airplane for sure. If they're not thought out properly, it looks like just a bunch of drafting templates that got thrown on the airplane. It can ruin a perfectly good plane. When it's done right, it really adds a nice little dimension to the airplane that otherwise wouldn't be there. Now you can see on the sidewinder, the reason I'm doing these two airplanes is contrasting types of ink lines. This airplane has very busy ink lines. Indicating where the ribs would be, the catwalks, all of the tail. The Red Baron has very basic, I'd say uh, just standard type of ink lines, very few, indicating where the ailerons and driven tabs would be. Some of the little hatches, some of the little gas caps, but not overdone. When you lay out a scheme for ink lines, it's a good idea to take a little picture, draw a little sketch of your airplane, and come up with an idea before you do it. Don't just randomly run off and do it. And if you look at the basic video, it shows a lot of little templates and little things that go into making up some of these patterns some of these things on the body, all done with patterns. Again, all this is covered on the Sidewinder videos, but we're just going to go through this a little bit, being this is a finishing video. I don't see how a finishing video could be complete without ink line work. Now, this is one of the planes, even though this is a concourse winning plane, I wasn't crazy about the incline work on here. This is what I find uh, just doesn't look realistic. Criticizing my own plane here. Just doesn't make rhyme or reason, doesn't make sense. Now, this, in my taste, this incline work is a little bit better. Now, notice the tail, the inclines are spaced half of what they are on the wing. So it tends to look like a little mirror image. That's what it's supposed to look like. I want to do a little basic information again. If you saw the uh, 
the basic video. You saw the one about Tom Lay Letra sets. I want to take out this is a tool you can buy from Letra set for about five bucks. Tom Lay's Letra sets are excellent. What you want to do is take the sheet. If you've never used them before, this would be obviously a little test. You'd want to run a little test. Okay, so take a piece of clean backing paper and they give you wax paper with it. You get a piece of wax paper. Take the sheet. Let's say you want to use the, uh, the, the number one. Just press on it real easy. It's called pre-releasing over the wax paper. Don't get too carried away. It'll start to turn white. Pull that up off. Okay. Now, if you want to pre-release these, I'm doing this on wax paper now. I don't have an airplane that's ready for letter sets. What you could do, especially with bigger numbers, is take, let's say we're going to take the zero. Do this over cardboard just gently ever so gently then take it over to the airplane. Now see these pre this is not pre-released this is pre-released I mean now once I put this in position now press it right down now remember if you press too hard finish it up with the flat end of the stick when you press too hard what's going to happen you're going to put a dent in the airplane you definitely don't want to put a dent in the airplane and that comes off real nice now the purpose of this, the next step is the purpose of this Tom Lay Letra set that's real handy is if you look at it real close you can see he has it says powered by ST and Super Tiger and everything. It's really a good sheet. It has a lot of the things you're going to use over and over again. And they're all laid out in order. Now if you don't have it laid out in order what you have to do Let's say this is the wing of the airplane. If you don't have this laid out, what you do is take yourself a piece of tape. I like to use fine line tape. Take a piece of tape. Lay yourself out a line on the, on the airplane. Make sure it's straight. Check it with a ruler. If you're using old Letra sets, you better pre-release them for sure. But if if these are relatively new, now you can use that line for alignment. You can kind of line it up. Okay, let's say you need the five. You're doing your AMA number. Okay, now, because the sheet is clear, you can look right through it. And you can use the same line to line up whatever the next letter is. Now it's a really really good idea is to think about these before you go putting gas caps on the bottom of the wing and air vents on the wheel pants. Think about where you want your letters and numbers. Draw a little sketch out. Uh, Steve Busso when he sells the plans to some of his planes sell, sells or well, gives away uh, just blank sketches of his airplane so you can try different Letra set patterns and this one says Pampa so you'd want to and even have two of them uh, AMA, FAI, big AMA numbers if you need an extra letter say if your number was 555 you could get the number from Tom he would be glad to send it to you and his name and address appear on the sheet now I like to think ahead of time and kind of put things where they belong put the super tiger up on the nose put the no push no push generally would be on an elevator no step would be on where a, a flap would end on a real airplane you don't step on the flaps experimental would probably go under the cockpit that kind of a thing and you wouldn't want to have the 38 psi uh, on the rudder that would go near the wheel pants, radio control servos I don't know where you would put those if it's not a radio ship jet intake emergency maybe you'd want to make a little hatch for where the emergency 
handles would be, battery, oil, water. This is definitely a nice sheet. And definitely, by not having to go through and individually line up all these letters, if you've ever done this from a normal letter set sheet, you can absolutely go crazy when you do that. It will take a long time to do that. Now, if you decide you're going to make up your own letter set sheet, of course, then you're way ahead of the game. What you do is you make it up once. You make the pattern that you want. You put the number that you want. You make these from black letter sets. Then you have this photocopied and made into your own letter set. And there's places all over that do this. The cost is a little more than regular letter sets, but the, the benefit is you can do any color you want. Green, red, yellow, gold. I think the gold and silver are a few bucks more. Another thing you might want to even consider is these are normal letter sets that I've cut up is whenever you have these thin letter sets like these are just outlines really you really they're, they're much more delicate than these type the big wide ones so if you're beginning you want to start out with nice big fat this type I would say is the beginning anything that has thin lines or thin like this can really get to be a pain in the neck and it, you, what happens if in this case if my number is 72618 if I botch up the 8, I have to go buy another $12 sheet just to get the 8. You see what I'm saying? So you really don't want to get, if you're going to put a name of a plane here and it needs three W's, well, and you ruin one, well, you're finished. So you think about this a little bit. And in my case, what I always do, because my approach to this is I don't want to spend extra time going to the store and back, whatever I need, I usually buy double and triple of what I need. And that's how I wind up with a you know, a box with a, a thousand things in it here. All kinds of junk. Hundreds of sheets of junk in here. So this is just what I, you know, what I've accumulated over 35 years of doing this. There's a lot of extra letters. Now what this is helpful for, along comes somebody that's doing a plane. And they need one extra A, B, C, D. Well, geez, I probably have it. You don't have to go buy the whole sheet because I probably have whatever you need. So it can be a money saver in the long run. If you intend to stay with the hobby long, it can be a real money saver. You can see these are pretty thick. It's been hard to release them. Another trick, boy, trick o -matic. Don't ever get fooled into using any brand except Letra Set. There are other brands, I don't know why, but the only ones I have good luck with are the Letra Sets or the ones that come from photocopies. Any of the other ones, absolutely junk. The press types melt. You put dope on them and they melt or they move. The, the glue doesn't seem to be the same. Letra sets are definitely, if it doesn't say Letra set up there in the corner, just go buy another brand and be done with it. Now this is the set of pens I used, I showed in the first video. What you can see is they're each marked on the end. And it tells you what thickness the line would be. Some of them, it's best to get a set too. You save money in the long run getting a set. Okay, you want to take a little template, whatever template that is, these little pattern things. Put tape on the side, right up to the edge, but not touching it. A couple layers of tape. And again, you could make your own shapes and sizes here. There's no reason to use these other than the fact they're convenient. What you want to really do is, ahead of time, is think about what the hell you want this plane to look like. Do you want it to look like a drafting template or like an airplane? And get some ideas where you want to have rivet heads, where you want to have slots and dots. Another thing Frank McMillan uh, had a great idea, or passed along a good idea, was that just before you ink the plane, wipe it with talcum powder. Now because the template is not touching, we can peel that up and we have a perfect little line. If we wanted to do two of them, try to hold the pen straight up and down, put it down on a paper, make your line and get it off the paper so you don't get a blob. Whenever you're using, here's the old thing from the Cardinal, look how old this thing is. Let me peel some of the extra tape off of this. 
But if the day comes I want to make me another cardinal, and I don't want to go through this aggravation of making another one, I can just get rid of some of the tape on this. Now even though that's a rough template, we can kind of line him up, start in one end, hold the pen straight up and down, Now we're, we're missing a point because we have tape hanging out here that just fell out. I could pretty much get that shape of that up here and hit the piece of tape. But anyway, that's just a rough idea of how you can go about doing this. This is the one for the ink line on the nose of the, the griffin. And if you Obviously, if you want it to be symmetrical, I think that now the reason I get a dot there is because I started and stopped. What you want to do is get the pen down, do one line, and get it off the paper. Don't leave the pen down even a second longer than necessary. Now, this point tip is a point six zero. That's a relatively thick line. Now, what I want to do. I want to take out a thinner line. This is a .35, just to show you the difference, how thin and thick the lines can be. This line will be like half of the thickness. And it's always good to experiment on a piece of paper before you go and ink up the airplane. Get an idea of what your shapes and sizes look like before you go inking up the plane. Any other, and there's just, I mean, there's just literally hundreds of these things. I must have 50 of these things, and you can see they've been used, they're well worn out, whatever, whatever. Another cardinal head. Any of these, this one here has a particularly nice set because the circles get bigger and smaller, and it looks like this is the last one I was using. So I can just go in here and, you know, I can feel free to use any of these circles. But keep in mind what you want to do, the most important thing is practice. Get an idea, get a plan of what you want it to look like. Don't just assume you're going to run off and, and you know ink the whole plane up in one afternoon. I generally spend the whole weekend inking a plane. Another thing too is this, this ink. In this case, in this set of pens they give you, let's see if you can read the name on this. It's called Ultra Draw. All this ink is made for, let's see what it says, for paper. Okay, the better ink, and, I, and that's the one that's in the pens now, is made for mylar. It says made for mylar on it. That's the ink that you want to use. Now here's what typically happens. If you were to use these flat, without the tape underneath them, the ink tends to bleed underneath. And I don't know if you, you probably can't see it, but you do get a little smudginess, especially in the corners. So you always have the tape so it holds it a little bit up. It just wants to hold it off the paper. The thickness of a, a piece of tape is plenty. And this here is the best set of pens that I've found. Absolutely the best set, no doubt about it. The other ones, maybe they're $10 cheaper, but these are definitely the best. Pick yourself up a set of these. You're set for life. Keep them clean. You'll never have to buy other pens. This is definitely the brand I would want. Now Jimmy Casale has a real neat way of doing his trim. His trim is pretty complex. It involves a lot of little stars. The stars get bigger and smaller as they go out to the wingtip. Now what Jimmy does, and I think it's a real neat way to do it, is he takes a piece of this paper, which is regular Xerox paper from a Xerox machine, takes the piece of paper and cuts his pattern into it with a razor blade. So he would have this. This is what it would look like. And whatever shape size you want. Now, with the little pieces missing, the way he attaches this to the wing, 
and this is a real nice way to do it, is take rubber cement and paint the wing of the airplane. This is the wing of the plane painted with rubber cement. You can buy rubber cement in any uh, store, sell stationary equipment. Then he puts the piece of paper right down in position. Now remember, there's little holes where the stars go. And in, in that area, he just takes his raw finger and rubs out the rubber cement, and it'll ball up like chewing gum. It'll ball up just like chewing gum. And just keep wiping toward the corners, toward the corners. Then obviously all you do is spray it, pill up the piece, and you have your stars right in place. Very easy to do a complex trim, or if you have letters that, I don't know, remember the name of his plane, but anyway, the, the, the letters could be whatever, and you can make the most complex trim without using masking tape. This is a really nice way of getting nice neat edges too. Just press them all down. Uh, the rubber cement, start at the middle and work your way to the corners if you're doing stars. Then you'll have no rubber cement in this area. When you spray over it, just airbrush over it, pull that up, you're finished. It's a real nice way of doing trim. Got to give thanks to Jimmy Cassell for that one. Now, whenever you're going to do any real amount of spraying, a couple little tricks you can use to your advantage in dealing with spray equipment. Cleaning the gun. It's always a pain in the neck. Nobody ever really wants to do it after spraying. But if you don't do it, you're going to wind up with really having a pain in the neck. If you, clean, if you keep the gun clean at the end of every time you use it, spray a gun of thinner through it. That's a good start. You can soak the gun if it's really bad. You can take a gallon can of thinner, buy cheap thinner, and just take scissors and cut off the top of the can so it in effect it looks like a waste paper can. And just leave the gun, take the gun apart and leave it soaking in there, whatever the parts are. Leave it soaking overnight, take it out and clean it. That's one good way, especially if you only have one gun. Now, my suggestion is you do what I do, and being I'm such a, a fanatic, is the gun, you make one gun for clear paint only. You never put anything in that gun beside clear. And you never wind up, as I did in the past, painting a plane that was white and in the middle of it, putting the clear on, out come a poo, a big spit of red. If you have a clear gun, the guns are not that expensive. You can get a gun and use it only for clear. Then keep your other gun for colors. And if you're going to use metal flake or any of the flake paint, you need a flake gun. The reason is when you start spraying those little micro flakes on things, you're going to wind up a month after you're done painting, you're going to be painting something green, red, yellow, and out's going to come one gold flake, and it's going to look terrible in the middle of the paint. So if you have three guns, a gun for flake, a gun for color, and a clear gun, three guns, you're safe. You should be in good shape. Now this is my gun for colored paint. This is my gun for clear. And this is my gun for doing flake paint. Three guns. When you're not using them, leave thinner in them. Keep them clean. You don't have to clean the outside. Don't get preoccupied. See all those globs on the outside? This is not a problem. What's a problem is when you don't clean the inside. The outside can be terrible. This is a DeVilbus gun. This is really unnecessarily expensive. This is a $19 gun that you can buy from Indy RC. And I believe the other one is uh, Russ Hunsberger's old gun. It was like a $20 or a $30 gun. So my suggestion is don't put anything other than clear in the clear gun. Paint in the paint gun and flake in the flake gun. Three guns and you're pretty well set for life. A couple of quick ideas. Things you can do to save money. And believe me, I know, because I'm 
about as strapped for money as anybody can be. A lot of times I go without having lunch so I can have extra thinner. It's because I'm a sick puppy. Anyway, you can buy big amounts of thinner. Typical pricing in New York City, you can buy a gallon for $20 if you want sig thinner. You can buy a gallon of 3608S for about half of that price. And you can cut this price in half if you buy a five gallon can. Somewhere around $28 you can get a five gallon can. So what that means is you can really save some big money. You know you're going to use thinner. A typical airplane will use two to three gallons of thinner unless you don't add enough thinner to the paint. So if you possibly can lay out the money, get the five gallon can. You know you're going to use it eventually. You're going to clean, and you'll be have an incentive to clean your guns then. You won't be trying to save the last little drop of thinner. Second thing, big amounts of paint. If you know you're going to paint this plane white and the next plane white and the next plane white and the next one white, why buy a quart? Buy a gallon. A gallon will cost you about half. You can cut the price about in half if you buy gallons. Whether you buy SIG or whether you buy acrylic lacquer, you can cut the price in half when you buy a gallon. If you know you're going to stick with a certain color, buy a big amount. Now I'm assuming you're going to use this. You're not going to buy a gallon and try to use it eight years later. That's not such a good economy move. But if you know you're going to use it in the course of a year, buy an amount that you would use in a year. Other things you can save money on. Sandpaper. If you buy a sleeve of sandpaper, and this is what a sleeve looks like, it's a package, it has a hundred sheets in it, it identifies what number it is. This pack of sandpaper, if you buy individual sheets in the New York City area, it can be up to 75 cents a piece, sometimes even 85 for the good stuff. If you buy a sleeve, you can cut the price in about half. You can get it to 30, 35 cents a sheet. You know you're going to use sandpaper. You know you're going to use a sleeve of 400 on every plane. So why fool around? Buy a sleeve. Prepsol. We talked about Prepsol. Very few planes that I build, I don't wind up using a gallon of Prepsol in the course of repairing, cleaning. Oh, by the way, Prepsol is excellent. After flying for a whole day, you want to get off all that castor oil, and especially in cold weather. That cuts it right down. That's a great degreaser. Great for cleaning engine parts. The one thing you don't want to do is clean an engine part, especially an iron part, and just leave it out in the air. It'll rust. This is a good degreaser. Prepsol or the Sickens brand, either one. But buy big amounts. The idea is if you can afford to buy a gallon and you're going to use it, buy a gallon. Don't fool around. Same thing with this, even though you don't think this is a big thing, compound. You can buy the big can of compound, especially white, in a body shop supply house, and they make compound for wheel use or hand use. You can buy the big can. It's going to cost you less than half than if you buy the cans in the A&P, the little pint cans. I don't know where you can buy Gorham Silver Polish in big quantities, but if I find out, great. In the meantime, I have to buy it in the A&P just like everybody else. Uh, a lot of other things. If you're going to use a big amount, Try to use it, try to buy an amount that you could use in a year. That's always the key. If you can use it in a year, buy it. You'll always wind up ahead of the game on money. And one of the things everybody has trouble with is cleaning the hinges. Cleaning the paint off the hinges. One of the neatest ways to do this, you'll notice every time you put three coats of paint, you go to clean your hinge line, and here's the hinge sitting here, and there's little stalactites growing in there, and it's, it's just in general a mess. Now what I do is in between every coat of paint, take a piece of 320 sandpaper, fold it back over itself, and go right down the hinge line, right down the hinge line. Keep that clean. If it's clean by double the thickness of a piece of 320, you won't build up all those little stalactites in there and it won't make for a messy job. 
you also want to clean the hinges. You take a number 11 blade, which looks like this, if you know what an, an exacto number 11 blade looks like. Take that, take a hinge, and take a Dremel tool with a stone and cut that tip so that the tip winds up looking like this. Now, if this matches the diameter of the pin, you can go right down, zip, in one shot and clean the hinges. Every time you put dope, go zip, 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 get all that cleaned out. When you get to the last coat of clear, you'll remove that coat of clear and you'll have a perfect hinge job every time. This is a little trick that's, you make this little tool up yourself, it's worth its weight in gold. Absolutely worth its weight in gold. And keeping those hinge lines clean, that's another thing. If you just take a piece of 320, fold it back over itself, now it's pretty stiff and go up and down the hinge line up and every time you paint you will not have a problem. If you get any tighter than a piece of 320 folded back, always going to be a problem. Another question a lot of people are unsure about is canopies. This is a canopy off a Sig Cougar. It's a nice, I guess, relative size and shape for a stunt ship. It fits our needs nice. One of the things you do when you sink this onto the block, do all your little canopy detail inside, set this down in the block. Now one of the things that you don't want to have is where the finish comes up to the canopy and there's a step before it gets to the canopy. You want to kind of blend this so it all flows in. So when you get to the point where you're going to paint the clear on the plane, what I do is I take all the tape off the canopy, get this edge nice and smooth, and spray a coat of clear right over the canopy. Now if you spray over the canopy with clear, it's a good idea to scuff it up with 600 first, then spray it with one coat of clear. Not a lot of thinner. If you use penetrating thinner, high gloss thinner, retorter, you'll melt the canopy and it'll just go which I've already done. One coat of clear at a time, let it dry overnight, maybe five coats all together, and then buff the canopy out the same way you buff the plane out. So that you're, you don't feel any, any line as it becomes canopy plane. It just blends in all at once. It's a constant blend that way. You don't have that edge, that ripple, of, ripple effect, or whatever you call it. Put as much clear on a canopy as you want, sand it, and buff it out. Just don't use a lot of thinner. Now one thing everybody likes to have when they go to the Nats is a show prop. And that's a prop that's painted up and buffed out real nice. You put it on at appearance judging. As soon as it's finished with the appearance judging, you take it off, wrap it up, and put it back in your toolbox. To make yourself a nice show prop, especially if it's a wood prop, Take some tin foil and make a little tank the size of the prop. You can make it out of tin foil, it doesn't have to be fancy or a can. And this will be the wood. Let's assume it's a two bladed wood prop. If it's three blade, you have to use a different uh, shaped box. Fill the tank with acetone, drop the prop in, let it sit for five minutes, take it out. Let it dry, sand off whatever finish is left and it won't be much, especially if it's a rev up prop. Take two coats of auto primer, color whatever color, usually it's black with yellow tips or whatever. Put the clear on, just like you would finish a plane. Okay, now the prop doesn't have to balance, obviously, if it's a show prop. You're just going to use it for show. So you want to buff it out. Now, little neat tricks I've noticed. On the blade of the prop, some of the props I used to put Mike Dietrich used to do it too. I used to put the name of the plane in letter sets, the Cardinal or Tradition or whatever, in little letter sets. You could also mask off the tips and make the tips, if this is red for a red plane, black for a black plane, you could fancy it up. Okay. Now, if you want to make a show prop to fly with, a lot of the props I use, they're painted and they're functional props. 
you do the acetone trick, get the finish off the prop, let it dry, sand it smooth. But right here, now you go into a three-step process. If this is going to be a flying prop, you sand it smooth and balance the wood. That's important. The wood part of the prop should balance. Do the auto primer and balance the primer. While it's in primer, balance it. Put the color on and balance it. Put the clear on and balance it. Even though this sounds really complicated, the reason being, what happens if you wait to the very end, if you wait to down here to balance the prop, it, number one, it could be so out of balance it would blow your mind. Number two, what can happen is the wood will balance, I mean the wood will be out of balance and the paint won't be. So you'll constantly be going through on the heavy blade, on the light blade I mean. So you want to balance it four times or five times right through the process to get this to be a functional prop if it's going to be a show prop to fly with. Don't skimp on the balancing steps, that's important. Another thing I used to do when I used to, Richie Tower used to have this really great spray booth we could spray him run in. I used to go over there and take four or five props at a time and the last, after they were painted and everything, put the clear on and Imron and those props would be absolutely fuel proof, bulletproof, beautiful. Problem is if you spray Imron and you're not really equipped to do it, you're going to wind up either hurting yourself or killing yourself. So acrylic clear is real good for doing props, especially if you're going to use this as a flying prop. Right in here when you sand it smooth, you could check the pitch, both blades for being equal. Change the pitch, put a Phillips entry in it, razor blade out the front, whatever it is that you want to do. We're planning at least in the upcoming year I'm going to do a whole video about modifying props. A lot of people ask what's a Phillips entry, what's thinning the blades mean. Well we're going to go into that well, as soon as that video becomes available it'll be in detail. Anyway making props up can be nice. You can do a nice job on it. Make them match the plane. It adds a little bit of pizzazz to it. Now this is just one example of a prop that's been painted. This is a Brian Ether carbon fiber prop. It's not a Bali prop, this is a Brian Ether prop. And it's been painted to be a functional and a show prop at the same time. And when used with the Tune Pipe Super Tiger 60, it makes for a, a nice combination. Again, on this plane you might want to look at how the canopy blends right in, that nice little fillet that goes into the canopy. That's always your final touch, the ink lining around the canopy. And one, of the, one of the things I particularly like is when you have an airplane and it's finished it's all buffed out and everything. It's to have all the little final details on it. The little prop tips painted, the canopy detail, all the little letter sets and ink lines right. And then you combine all the little details that go into making an airplane. Usually you wind up with something pretty special. You wind up with something that you really can't be proud of. It really takes a lot of extra work to do this. But just like this handmade header that's on this plane. Now this is a handmade header and it's anodized red to match the airplane. Now I could just have left it aluminum color, sure that would be fine. But I wanted everything, I wanted all the little details. I could have just used the, uh, the Brian Ether props come just black. I could have just left it. I wanted the little tips painted, I wanted it balanced. All the little details that go into one of these guys is the difference between really having something special and just having just another airplane out on the field. That is the sidewinder. You notice a lot of little things like the stripes on the wheel pants, stripes on the bottom of the body, a little ink line up on the nose. I showed the template for that on the previously in the video. All the ink lines on the wing. All the canopy detail. 
There's a lot of little things on this plane you don't even notice until you look at it real close. This is a little solid wood tail for a nostalgia ship. I have a couple of coats of clear on this now. I'm just waiting for this to dry out and I'm going to put the filler on this. You can see how nice and smooth it's sanded out. This is about how it should be sanded out before and after you put the first couple of coats of clear on. Now here's an important concept. As long as we're going to talk about finish, that old thing about killing a CG and making a plane tail heavy, if that's our typical stunt ship, these areas here in red, everything from the CG forward, feel free, paint away, especially the nose of the plane, keep it fuel proof, especially the tank box. That much of the airplane no problem, paint away. This part of the plane in black X's, take it easy, don't go crazy. And this part back here, super light on the paint, don't go crazy on the tail. This part of the plane back here, very little paint. Now, also important to remember, as long as we have this here, is any wood that you use in this area, well, hell, you can use medium wood, no problem. Medium wood, you can even use heavy wood. The sheeting for the leading edge can be heavy. The part of the fuse side that's up here should be heavy. No problem. The back of this, this part of the wing skins, sheeting, whatever, this could even be you know, medium to light. But anything from the flaps back, this whole part of the plane, light. That's the way to retain the CG. Now, the purpose of doing this, the purpose of having as much of the heavy wood forward in the airplane or out here, out here obviously you could make a an outer wingtip out of a piece of pine. The purpose of doing this is now it allows you to put more paint over the whole plane. If you already have the wood on the plane so that it's already tail heavy before you go to paint it, you've got a built-in problem. You want to keep this from the flaps back super light and the paint to a minimum and the bottom paint almost non-existent. It's this part of the airplane back here, this whole part. We want to have the lightest wood, the minimum amount of extra paint, extra everything. This concept of not destroying the CG, what this usually means is instead of putting two ounces of nose weight in the plane, the, the nose weight is two ounces and back here you have an ounce, three ounces.
you can save three ounces by just getting the CG right. Nothing else. So it's worth putting the extra effort. It's worth understanding this concept, getting the heavy wood and extra paint in the front, relatively medium in the middle, and light in the back. And the further back into the plane, in other words, this could be the lightest piece of wood in the plane, the second lightest piece, the third lightest piece, the fourth lightest piece, on and on and on. You can also use, if you make up individual wing skins, use the heavy wing skins on the outboard wing, the light wing skins on the inboard wing. There's a thousand little tricks like that. But to try to get the weight of the airplane forward and keep the tail light. Any plane I've ever built that had a light tail and balanced right, it almost didn't matter what it weighed. It was much more important that the CG be right and that the wood and the paint be on in proper proportions. And if you think I'm kidding, and you check out the basic trim video, I think I spent one third of that video emphasizing that the CG must be right. Anytime you trade away to CG, you wind up with lead outs coming crazy and tip weight that, that's crazy and all kind of offsets and things. If you build a plane with the CG right, even if it's a little heavy, it'll perform. Getting that lead out of the nose is a big part of it. And that's one way to do it without a lot of extra effort. That's the easiest way in the long run to do it. Okay, let's say you're a super expert now. You want to do a candy apple plane. Candy apple like that red airplane. It was just on a video not long ago. All right, you must have silver perfect. It must even be more perfect in silver than it would be if you were to paint it white or yellow or green. The reason being, when you put candy apple has no pigment in it. It has dye. And the light is going to go through the candy apple, hit the silver, and come back out. That's what's going to happen. This is the candy. Now, it looks real impressive in, in sunlight especially. And I'll bring this point up even a little further. This is really a funny story. Having a candy apple plane will save you some weight because there's no pigment in a candy apple. Not a whole lot, it'll save some. But your silver and gold underneath must be perfect. Absolutely must be perfect. Now, what happens with a candy apple plane, when there's no sun, it doesn't look candy apple, it just looks just red. But when the sun comes out, wow, it really looks neat. So, here's the trick. Don't fall for this trick that I went to. Don't go to appearance judging with a candy apple plane and put your plane where the most light isn't on it. If there's a light in a room, get your airplane right underneath the light or it doesn't look anywhere near as good if it's over here and the light is in the middle of the room, which is what happened a couple of times already. The plane doesn't look anywhere near as brilliant or bright as if it's under the light. When you go to appearance judge and here's the room and here's the lights in the room, just look for somebody's plane that's underneath the lights. It's going to look much brighter if they make the appearance rows here, 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 and one of them is right under a light. The plane under the light is going to look great. It's going to absolutely, these planes are going to look great. And these over here are going to look shadowy and not that good. It's an important little thing how to get your plane down into appearance judging so it's under a light and it looks real good. Another thing that I thought was really funny is 1986, I, uh, in 86, I had a red plane. 1987, a totally different plane, but it was red. So here I come, 1988, and I have a brand new red plane with very little flights on it. And as I'm walking through appearance rows, I hear a bunch of people say, oh, that's Wendy's plane. He didn't build a new plane. That's the same one. Even though this plane was a built-up plane and all of that balarkey, people didn't realize it was a new plane. It looked like the old one, even though these two were totally different airplanes. This plane was a concourse winner. This plane was a 19 and a half point plane. It, the planes looked too much alike. So what I've done this year, in that, 
in a in a quest to make people realize that I build planes each year. 1989 was the Red Baron. In 1990 was the Yellow Plane, the Sidewinder. So now I'm refinishing this 1988 plane. If I refinish it red, what's going to happen? Everybody's going to say, oh, that's one of Wendy's old planes. Now what I'm going to do is have an old plane that looks like I built a new plane. If I fly that, and it probably will fly that at the 91 Nats, it'll be green. And everybody will think it's a new plane, and it isn't. Of course, I got screwed here once, and people thinking that it wasn't a new plane. So, there's a lot of little details that go into making up this, giving people the best impression at appearance judging. It's definitely not just a thing of having an ISIS airplane. There's a lot more to it than that. Now, it'd be unfair. We're almost at the end of this advanced video. It'd be unfair not to thank the people that were responsible for helping me years ago. And the primary one, of course, was Harold Price. This was way back in 1968. He helped me spray this plane. This was the original sweeper. So I want to make sure that people out there understand he was instrumental in helping me. And I want to make sure, even though he's gone now, and I thanked him on the basic video, that he does get his share of recognition, even though it's post-mortem. Harold, you did a hell of a job. Thanks a lot. And for all the people that I'm helping, well, maybe you'll put my name in a video someday. So I'm going to close this video out, what's left of it, with a couple of what I hope are going to be inspirational photographs from my own personal album, give you some ideas on how to do paint jobs, somebody you can steal their paint job from, their trim, whatever, some good ideas maybe you can use.